Hi, I'm Miguel Sihuco. I'm from the Philippines. I'm going to be reading from my brand new novel, Illustrado. Um, I just want to say I'm really thrilled to be here. It's my first book. So. Thank you. Thanks. I'll be reading from the beginning. The panther lurks no longer in foreign shadows. He's come home to rest. Crispin Salvador's fitting et epitaph by his request is merely his name. From an unattributed obituary, the Philippine Sun, February 12, 2002. When the author's life of literature and exile reached its unscheduled terminus that anonymous February morning, he was close to completing his controversial book we'd all been waiting for. His body, floating in the Hudson, had been hooked by a Chinese fisherman, his arms, battered, open to a virginal dawn, Christ-like, one blog back home reported, sarcastically. Ratty banded briefs and Armenia Gildo Zenia trousers were pulled around his ankles, both shoes lost. A crown of blood embellished the high forehead, smashed by a crowbar or dock pile or chunk of frozen river. That afternoon, as if in a dream, I stood in the brittle cold, outside the yellow police tape surrounding the entrance of my dead mentor's West Village apartment. The rumors were already milling. The NYPD had found a home in disarray. Plainclothes detectives filled many evidence bags with strange items. Neighbors reported having heard shouts into the night. The old lady next door said her cat had refused to come out from under the bed. The cat, she emphasized, was a black one. Investigators quickly declared there was no evidence of foul play. You may recall seeing the case in the news, though the coverage was short-lived in the months following September 11, 2001. Only much later, during lulls in the news cycle, was Salvador mentioned at any length in the Western media, a short feature in the art section of the New York Times, a piece in Le Monde on anti-colonial expatriates who lived in Paris, and a negligible reference at the end of a Village Voice article about famous New York suicides. After that, nothing. At home in the Philippines, however, Salvador's sudden silencing was immediately autopsied on both sides of the political divide. Both the Philippine Gazette and the Sun traded blows with Salvador's own Manila Times, debating the author's literary and indeed social significance to our weary country. The Times, of course, declared their dead columnist the waylaid hope of a culture's literary renaissance. The Gazette argued that Salvador was not an authentic Filipino writer because he wrote mostly in English and was not brown by the same sun as the masses. The Sun said Salvador was too middling to merit murder. Suicide, each of the three papers concluded, was a fitting resolution. When news emerged of the missing manuscript, Every side discarded any remaining equipoise. The legend of the unfinished book had persisted for over two decades, and its loss reverberated more than its author's death. Online, the blogosphere grew gleeful with conjecture as to its whereabouts. The literati, the career journalists foremost among them, abandoned all objectivity. Many doubted the manuscript's existence in the first place. The few who believed it was real dismissed it as both a social and personal poison. Almost everyone agreed that it was tied to Crispin's fate. None among Salvador's colleagues and acquaintances, he no longer had any real friends, questioned the suicide verdict. After two weeks of conjecture, everyone was happy to forget the whole thing. I was unconvinced. No one knew what I knew. And I'm, I'm, so what I've done with this book is I've created the whole life's work of Crispin Salvador. Um, so there are excerpts from his memoirs and poetry and fiction and interviews. And through that, I've been able to trace 150 years of Philippine history. And I'd like to read just a, a short passage from one of Crispin's works, from, from his, um, his, his memoir, uh, the massive 2,500-page uh, self-published uh, book, Autoplagiarist. 
On one of the last few days before the city fell to the Japanese, we lined Dewey Boulevard, scores of us along the broad avenue, the breeze off the bay just cool enough for goosebumps. I was perched on Tita Jason's shoulders, and I remember watching birds dueling recklessly in the blue sky above the long curve of water. They fled into the endless expanse when a bugle called. The sky then was still trying to retain its innocence. Then I, then I saw the men on their mounts arriving for their dramatic departure, dividing the crowd, splendid, tall, like centaurs passing through wheat. They came, the 26th Cavalry Regiment of the Philippine Scouts, Americans and Filipinos side by side in formation in two long columns. I still hear their equipment jangle, the slow clop of hooves, still see the sun reflecting on their horses' polished martingale, on their own breast buckles and the insignia of the charging horse head and the saber raised above it. The metal on their bodies glowed like our hearts, the Japanese were to land at Lingayen, and the cavalry began their journey to be among the first of the United States armed forces in the, foreign east to, in, in the far east to meet them. We, the people, were silent. Then we cheered, women reaching hands to caress the soldiers' boots and legs, to stroke the horses' manes and flanks, the way hopeful believers hold their hands out to rub the feet of cathedral saints. I remember and regret I covered my ears from the cheers. I've never heard its equal since. Tito Jason handed me to one of the riders, his brother, my uncle, Tito Odiseo, who let me ride in front of him for some way. When I was finally passed back from uncle to uncle, I struggled, not wanting to be left behind. I cried. The lines of the cavalry took an eternal instant to pass among us. When the spectators closed the gap behind them, those around us shook their heads and made the sign of the cross. Many wept. I could feel Tito Jason shudder convulsively as he lost sight of his brother. I held on to my uncle as we all listened to the sound of hooves fading. My young boy's memory may have inflated these details, but this is how I remember, remember that day. Outside the town of Morong, on January 16, 1942, that group of brave men and strong steeds later made the final horseback cavalry charge in the history of the U.S. military. These were the last of an ancient tradition, many felled by the cowardly hail of anonymous lead and mortars from Japanese positions. Those of the 26th who survived the charge fought on as infantry. Eventually, attrition forced General Wainwright, a cavalryman himself, to give the order to butcher the horses for food. How cruel that meat must have taken, tasted. Since then, the U.S. and Philippine cavalry have been tanks and helicopters, machines that know not the sacrifice of courage and duty. Thank you very much. <laughs>